ever wondered how to talk to your kids about death? We're going to talk about that in today's video. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time visiting with us, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to taking God's Word and making it simple. We want to help you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. And by the way, if you appreciate this ministry and content, at some point make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. We would love to have you as part of our family. Okay guys, so have you ever wondered how to have those kinds of conversations with your kids? Like, how do I talk about death? When is too early or too late to talk about that? And honestly, the same thing can be said of the discussion of sex and so many other things. And the short answer is, the sooner and the more naturally you do it, the better. Hey guys, before we get into this video, I've talked to you guys before about how my plans for this channel were very different from what it looks like now thanks to COVID, and that's pretty much life in general is very different than what we had planned. Um, but I had originally planned a series called Magnificent Mondays or something like that, where I would take a very, very practical subject such as how to teach your child about death and discuss that on a video on Mondays. And because of the coronavirus and having to double um, my teaching where I originally only had one day a week where we would have had walkthroughs like our walkthrough Genesis, and now we have Proverbs and Psalms as well, right? That has, that has tripled that load um, because it is, it is now serving both the online ministry and my local church. Um, but because of that, I don't have the margin. I don't have the ability to do more videos with my current machinery and or without help with editing. Um, and that's something that you can pray for is either we need better equipment or help with editing or we just have to keep things as they are. And that's fine. But um, this video is an example of something that would be on that Monday series where right now I don't have the margin to add that on Mondays every week. So let me know what you think. If you appreciate this being a super practical thing, please let me know, and uh, it, especially in the comments, please let me know. And that way, once we kind of come out of um, all of the COVID mess, I will know whether I should just continue doing multiple walkthroughs, if that's really what everybody wants, or whether I should go back to my plan of having some varied content throughout the week, a little bit more varied than what I have now. Guys, thank you very much, and now back to the video. But for a specific passage, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to go through verses 4 through 9. This is known as the Shema. It's a very important passage in Scripture that we should know, especially as it comes to raising children. So verse 4, chapter 6, verse 4 of Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Many of us are familiar with this passage. Jesus quotes from it. If you're not, that's okay. Let's move on in verse 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Verse 7 is the key part of this section for my purposes today. You shall teach them diligently. Now, specifically, it's talking about teaching God's words, right? Teaching the Bible. Specifically, at this point, it would have been the Pentateuch at the time that this was written, the first five books of the Bible. Um, but God's word deals with life and death. So even though the direct application is God's word overall, the indirect application that I'm pulling from is speaking about death. So you shall teach them diligently, God's precepts, God's words, you shall teach them diligently to your sons. And remember, you can also insert in daughters, right? Sons would have been the ones going through formal education. It would be implied all children in terms of what we're talking about. I'm, I'm not going to get into that today, but it's okay to understand this to be children for the sake of our discussion today in particular. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So if you've ever been to a Jewish person's house and they have some Hebrew words on the doorpost, 
now you know why. And in fact, many of the places that I have lived, I have actually printed some scripture and put it up in the doorway just as a, a little bit of tongue in cheek, but also just a way of sort of keeping that um, practice, even though it's not commanded for us today, the word is supposed to be written on our hearts. But it's just an interesting little thing to do, I guess, is the best way to word it. And I've taught on this passage before, so I'm not going to teach this passage in particular today, what I want to zero in on is the idea of teaching them diligently to your sons, and uh, you shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You're either doing something or you're not. So you're either rising, laying down, laying there, like this covers all the bases, right? No matter what you're doing, take every opportunity. In education, we call this the teachable moments, right? You find those moments where the child is receptive when it's the right moment to teach that lesson and you get it in there while you can, especially in the modern day. Children's attention spans have always been bad, but especially in the modern digital age, attention spans are horrible. And all my teachers are going, amen, right? Well, yeah, they are. So we've got to get those lessons in there when they're ready for them, when their brain and their heart is already there. That's the teachable moment. So what does this look like? Well, in, in the passage in Deuteronomy, children would not have gone to school somewhere else. There was formal education, thus the word sons, but the general education happened by shadowing your parents. If your father was a carpenter, you were going to be a carpenter. If your father was whatever, you were going to be that. And the woman would take the children for the first few years, and then she would take the daughters as they grew older and teach them all the ways of, you know, in that culture especially, keeping house. But also, as we see in the Proverbs 31 woman, they often had business ventures outside of the house too. So people tend to give the Old Testament a bad rap, like, oh yeah, women just had to be at home. You haven't read your Bible if that's what you think, but that's a different story for a different day. Um, back to the main point. We need to look for those teachable moments and take those opportunities to teach when they come up. Children are professional question askers. Don't believe me? Find a two-year-old. They will wear you out. And part of the reason for that is God has designed children to be little sponges, to soak everything up, which is why you got to be so careful what you fill them up with, what media you allow them to watch and all that. But I'll really get derailed if I go down that path. So I'm going to stick to my path here. Um, I told you guys before, my brain's like a squirrel in a cage. It just goes all over the place. I always make it back around. But anyway, we're going to forge through right now. I'm trying to keep myself on track. So... Children are designed to soak that stuff up and to learn it as you go, just like it talks about here in the Shema. It's just supposed to be a natural conversation. So how do you teach death or any subject like sex and so on to your child? Well, first, it needs to come up naturally. It's You don't need to wait till the kid's 15 and, okay, Johnny, it's time for this really awkward sex talk. And, you know, you kids already learned all this stuff in school and from their friends and the internet and their phones and all that, right? Um, but back to my main point of death, although, again, the way you teach is paralleled here. Um, you can't wait until they're older and then have one sit down awkward conversation. And you definitely shouldn't wait until a relative or a friend dies. This needs to be a natural conversation that happens as you go about life. And you may, because we live in an unnatural way in modern America. And what do I mean by that? We don't live, most of us, don't live with livestock. Most of us do not live on the land, so to speak. Most of us are not farmers and herders, right? In this time period, most people would have had some sort of a garden and some form of livestock. They may not have done that for a living, so to speak, but they would have had animals and a farm of some sort, you know, a small family farm. In the modern day, we get everything from a grocery store. We never have to figure anything out for ourselves. Well, that means that we are living in a very unnatural way. And that's not inherently bad, but it does bring with it some negative consequences, such as how do I talk to my kids about death? 
or sex. I'm probably just going to have to rename this video Death and Sex because I'm already getting into it. And again, these are two big topics that parallel each other, right? Um, in terms of the way that they're taught, as I've already explained. So let's focus back on death. How do you teach your child about death in a, in a unnatural state that we're in as modern Americans? Well, one, when children ask questions, answer them honestly, but simply. Bear in mind the age of your child and what they can and should be able to handle, right? I'm not going to whip my phone out and show my five-year-old some grotesque picture of somebody that got mangled in a car accident and say, see, Johnny, don't drink and drive. You will keep the counselors in business doing that, but that's not helpful to your child. But what is helpful is if you see some ants crawling around in the grass and you see one of them that's not moving, just go, hey, look, little Johnny, see that ant right there that's not moving? That one's dead. See, those ants are alive. That one isn't alive anymore. And Johnny's probably going to go, well, what do you mean not alive anymore? Well, he's not moving anymore. He will never move again, right? Eventually, his body will just go back into the ground or he'll get eaten by another bug, right? And most of the time, kids are going to go, ha, 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 that's funny, right? See, we don't give kids enough credit for having enough maturity to handle this stuff. Remember, God hardwired us to learn this way right? Uh, with my son, you know, I did lots of that kind of stuff as he was growing up, and my son's only six years old now. But with my son, we did lots of that kind of stuff. But about a year ago now, roughly a year ago now, we decided, okay, uh, he, one, he wanted a pet, and we wanted to do the old, let's find out if he's mature enough to do it, right? I mean, at the time, he was five years old. So we started small. We got a betta fish, because one, they're cheap, and two, they're pretty hardy, but it would demonstrate to us whether he has the responsibility to care for an animal without us telling him everything to do. That's the key, okay? Now, PETA would have a heart attack at this, but oh well, PETA's gonna have a heart attack with me in general. But what we decided is that we would teach him and walk him through the first week, maybe, or so, of caring for that fish. Here's the food. Here's how you feed the fish. Here's how often you feed the fish. Here's how much you feed the fish. Here's the responsibility with cleaning the water. Now, because of his age, we did help him with cleaning the water because that required more coordination and strength than he had. But then, once we were done with that week or two that we gave it to really teach him, we said, okay, this fish is now your responsibility. If this fish lives, it will be because you continued to feed him and he stayed healthy. We threw that one in there just in case it got some kind of disease. But if you don't feed this fish, it will die. Now, I'll be honest with you. I was 100% expecting that fish to be belly up in a week or two. I was not expecting the thing to survive. It's still alive to this day um, because my son continued feeding it. But even just warning him, if you don't feed it, it will die, was a natural opportunity to talk about death. You know, what, what do you mean die, Daddy? Well, what would happen if you didn't eat? I'd be really hungry, okay? What happens if you get really, really, really hungry and never eat? And since we had already talked about death, he goes, I would die? And I said, yes. And he goes, that would be sad. And I was like, yes, that would make all of us very sad. And by the way, that was my opportunity to talk to him about heaven and hell, right? See, when people die, if they believe in Jesus, they will go to heaven. If they don't, we will go to hell. Now, I didn't paint some tragic picture. Well, I mean, I was honest about what hell is. But in other words, I didn't try to scare my kids straight with hell. I just said that hell is a place that is not a happy place. It is a place that God does not... Uh, how did I word it? Um, hell is a place where people go to, that are punished by God. That's how I worded it. He's a child. He understands punishment. It's like an eternal timeout, right? I, hey, you can go ahead and word it that way. That's fine for a five-year-old, right? They don't need the grotesque details, but they do need the correct category. And heaven is a place where you go to be with God if you're dead because you believe in Jesus. We had to throw that in there because we can't lie to our child. If you believe in Jesus, you get to go to heaven. And that's, that's like hanging out with mommy and daddy, except it's God, 
right? It's very honest pictures of heaven and hell. So just by buying a darn goldfish, we get all these discussions that come out of it because we're willing to answer honest questions that our child is asking and mentioning something as simple as if you don't feed this fish, it will die, right? So many parents are so afraid to talk about death, they'd just be like, well, you know, make sure you feed that fish every day and then they're going to hound the kid every day. Worst case scenario, one random fish dies. Now, I believe that all life is precious. I don't want something to die. But the only way my child is going to learn responsibility is to have responsibility. And again, and I'm really getting off topic in general parenting now, but back to the main point, how is he ever going to learn about death if he never has the opportunity to see it? See, he also wanted to catch a caterpillar. He had one of those science kits that has like the container with magnifying glass and all that. No, he didn't burn it to death. Um, inadvertently, he starved it to death. Um, but we had a caterpillar. I don't know much about caterpillars, but he's a boy. He wanted to catch something and shove it in a jar and watch it. So, and the jar, it, it's, it's one of those little kits, like I said, so it had air holes and all that. So we took a couple of leaves, we put them in there, and we're talking to him. Like He's like, well, what does the caterpillar need? I'm like, well, he probably needs leaves. I don't really think they need water. You know, We tried to look it up online the best that we could, but it's a one random wild caterpillar. He wanted to watch it. So, okay, we put it in this little container. And the thing ended up dying very soon after that, within a couple of days because apparently we didn't pick out the correct leaves for it. So hey, if you're a parent and you didn't know this, some caterpillars only eat one type of leaf ever. And if you put the wrong type of leaf in there, they're not gonna eat and they'll die of starvation, poor little caterpillar, right? But I didn't shield my child from that. I didn't go out and what a lot of parents wanna do, they're gonna go out in the yard, they're gonna find another caterpillar and swap them. Or they're going to just make it disappear and tell the child, well, you know, the caterpillar escaped or something like that. One, you're teaching your child that you're a liar. Let that hit you for a second. If that's how you parent, you are teaching your child that you are a liar. And you wonder why they don't want to trust you later in life, right? Uh, kind of like that seven habits, right? You got to start with the end in mind, right? Begin with the end in mind, something like that. I can't quote it right off, but that's the idea, right? The leader in me. Some of, the parents, some of the teachers are going, yeah, he mentioned it, right? Um, but we didn't do that. One, because it would be dishonest, but two, because it would rob my child of the opportunity to learn something that he needs to learn to grow into a mature adult. You cannot be a mature adult and not understand death. You cannot have a concept of the world that is accurate if you don't understand death. And... You cannot possibly understand the gospel of Jesus Christ if you do not understand death. For the wages of sin is death. When you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell. If I love my child, if I love anybody, I want them to be in heaven. In fact, hell is so bad between you and me as an adult. Hell is so bad, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I don't want anybody to go to hell. And that's saying something because some of you have heard me talk about some of the things that happened with my dad. I don't even want him to go to hell. I want him to be punished, but I don't want him to go to hell. If I care about my son at all, I want him to be in heaven, and I understand that it has to be his genuine volitional choice. I can't just coerce my child into some confession. That creates a false Christian and is worse than if I had never shared the gospel with him to begin with. If I love my child at all, he needs to be able to decide to follow God or not, which means ultimately he will be in heaven or hell. How can my child choose to believe in Jesus if he doesn't even understand death. He can't. And we wonder why our children are so messed up because we won't teach them these concepts. See, most people don't understand that a concept of death is essential to understanding the gospel. And most people don't understand that because they've never been taught by their pastor or pastors. They've never been discipled. And unfortunately, many of them have never faithfully read the scriptures. They don't understand those concepts themselves. 
See, I had to let my child learn about death because he has to understand the world. So instead of making that caterpillar disappear and lying to my son or lying to him by swapping it, I left it right in the little container. I saw it well before he did, but I left it right in that little container all shriveled up and dead. And my son was sad. He cried over a caterpillar. And I mean, maybe I'm being too hard-hearted, but he boo-hooed over a caterpillar. And, you know, the, the male dad in me is like, really, kid? Get over it. But what I would be missing if I let that rule my emotions in that moment is I would be missing the fact that my son now understands death. And guys, the lessons of life hurt. The more you shield your child now within reason, like I said, I'm not pulling out pictures or I'm not, you know, I'm not going on the side of the road if there's a car accident going, oh, did somebody die? Can I let my kid see this? Right? I'm not trying to cause my child trauma. But I want him to understand death. And in that moment, he understood. Because something that was alive was now dead. And that lesson will repeat. Eventually this fish will die. We have a dog. Eventually the dog will die. Hope not for a long time, right? The other thing is, as a pastor, and, and this is something that I have the benefit of for my child, um, you know, funerals are not uncommon. <laughs> Um, my child has been to multiple funerals already. If you have the opportunity to take your child to a funeral, do it. You know, some of you are going, oh, but it'll traumatize my child. Start small with bugs and things like that and work your way up, but provide those opportunities. My son totally handles it. He gets it because he understands what death is and he understands heaven and hell. And thank God, literally thank God, my son believes in Jesus. He has genuine faith of his own. Different video, different day. But he has been to multiple funerals now. And in, in the sweetest childlike innocence moment, the very first funeral that he went to, he wanted to help bury the body because he understood that that body went into the ground and the soul went up to heaven for that particular person. And he wanted to help. Don't deny your children those opportunities, right? The mortician was more than accommodating because he understands, as a mortician, he understands the connection between death and life. But many of us, because of the way that we live in our country, we don't understand it anymore. So please, learn for yourself and teach your children in these very natural ways. And I'll do a separate video on sex sometimes. If you want me to, please put it in the comments. Please keep it G-rated. Um, but if you want me to do a video on how to teach your child about sex, I will do that. I've, I've kind of laid the foundation here, but there are some other important things that need to happen in those discussions as well. Um, so if that's something that you want, please let me know in the comments and I will add that to the queue or at least bump it up. It's in there eventually, but I'll bump it up in the queue how to have those kind of conversations. So guys, that is it for today. Um, if you appreciate this ministry and this content, please make sure you hit like, hit that subscribe, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. And please also, if you want to support this ministry, share this video on all your social media platforms, send it to somebody specific and definitely your social media platforms. Help us get the word out and grow this channel. I really want this channel to grow, not just because I hope to gain some benefit from it, but because I want God's Word to go out. And I think that this ministry is somewhat unique in that there aren't a lot of people on YouTube giving real discipleship lessons like this. There are some, and I'm so thankful for some of my brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing that. But by and large, the church hasn't gotten the idea of YouTube yet. So please help us build this channel so that we can get our witness out there. And then, of course, if you do want to support us financially, there is a link in the description. And this is a nonprofit ministry, so all donations are tax deductible. Guys, thank you very much, and God bless.